pretty good reconstruction of archaeological theory and toddler tantrums, centering early childhood in archaeological image production. So a little bit about me. I'm an archaeological illustrator, digital 3D modeler, and cartoonist, but my background is in early childhood education. Uh, I also have the flu right now, which is why I can't be with you, so I apologize for my voice and if I'm a little bit loopy. So the foundation of this project was having a background in early childhood education. As I started doing archaeological reconstruction and exploring archaeological reconstruction, I discovered a disconnect between the way childhood is presented in archaeological reconstruction and the childhood that I experienced in early childhood education, and I wanted to figure out what exactly was going on. So to do this, I first wanted to identify themes in representations of children in the heritage sector, and then produce illustrations that resisted those themes uh, to see if this kind of illustration would produce images of children that were more familiar. Looking at these recurring themes, I specifically wanted to figure out what stories were telling about children and childhood in the past. Uh, so in order to do this, I looked at the work of published archaeological illustrators, and specifically work published after 2001 to make sure I was getting a contemporary view on the representations of childhood in the discipline. Uh, of the thousands and thousands of images that I looked at, I was able to pull out 100 archaeological images of children uh, and then code the data and pull out these key themes. I then produced archaeological reconstructions that resisted these themes, answering images with images, uh, taking archaeological objects and building a childhood around it using modern gestures, expressions, and capacities of children to reimagine and re-image the past. The purpose of this image making wasn't to produce a high fidelity snapshot of the past, but instead uh, to illustrate objects in the hands of children, to force a concrete reflection on child-object interactions. It's reconstruction as a means of rethinking, reimagining, and re-imaging the past, and imaging as a tool for the practice of archaeological theory. These illustrations focus specifically on early childhood, uh, predominantly from zero to six years old, with a few children from six to eight. This is by no means a definition of childhood, especially early childhood, but it helps frame the project to focus on a time in childhood when children are developing physically, emotionally, and socially. Uh, the methodology was kept purposely simple, uh, with children being traced from modern children. Um, this allows a low barrier to entry, so that even with limited artistic skill, uh, these kind of reconstructions can be successful. Uh, the style was also kept purposely simple, with a cartoon realism employed to visually signal that these are not high fidelity reconstructions of the past, but imaginative engagements with it. So let's get into it. In looking at reconstructions of past childhood, two opposite themes emerge. One is the theme of the helpless child, and the other is the theme of the little adult, and both of these frames can be quite limiting. The first frame is that of the helpless child. These are children that are almost entirely dependent on adults and have very little independence or autonomy. This is especially visible in the presence of adults in archaeological images of children. So in the majority of these images, uh, children are pictured with adults, either supervised or accompanied. Now, children do appear alone, but interestingly, when they do appear alone, they're often not doing anything, but are instead just sort of standing passively, usually as a mannequin to model archaeological objects. In only three illustrations did we see children with children without adults present. Um, and interestingly, these were all by the same author. So part of this project was an intentional effort to depict children unsupervised, to show the capacity of children to do things without the presence of adults. One particular context in which adults are always present is that of learning. Uh, so in these reconstructions, learning is always presented as the formal instruction from adult to child. But actually, an adult is not a prerequisite for learning, and children have the capacity to teach each other, whether that is done informally, 
uh, as children copy other children or learn through helping, or more formally, as kids pass down craft production that they learned from an adult. And actually, much of childhood learning and development is done through self-directed learning, as kids explore the world, explore material properties, and explore objects. But this is something that we never see in archaeological reconstruction. But even beyond craft work and world building, children are active participants in cultural transmission, teaching each other, policing each other, learning from each other, and this is something that we engage with in the reconstructions that we make. When we look at representations of children's work, we see children's work as specifically supervised craft and domestic work. Uh, so they are either making things or they are doing chores with the help of a supervising adult. Occasionally we see children hunting, but that's always male children, and there's a whole other kettle of fish around that. But predominantly, it's craft and domestic work. But supervision is not necessary for doing craft work. And in fact, children are able to participate in craft work without supervision. Um, and in fact, any parent will tell you that craft work is a great way to keep children out from underfoot. But children can do a lot more than just making quilts pots. In fact, there's a whole range of economic work that children can participate in unsupervised, uh, whether it's digging or harvesting fruit or collecting crops. Children have an amazing capacity uh, to be able to do something once they are shown how. In fact, as we start to consider the capacities of children to produce and to use objects, we can see object use lives that are entirely child-centered. So it's possible for children to produce objects using skills that they learned from other children to be used by other children while simultaneously providing childcare for other children. In fact, childcare is a form of work that children are able to do and often have an affinity for. Uh, this is especially true when they are peri-supervised, when adults are around, but the children are participating in the primary acts of childcare, like feeding or entertaining. We also see in representations of past childhood a strict dichotomy between work and play. They are done in separate spaces, they have different emotional weights, and interestingly there's often a gendered division, with work being done by girls and play being done by boys. But actually, Children often participate in work playfully, whether it is making games of the work they're doing, finding joy in the work they're doing, or finding ways of bringing play into times when they should be doing work with the objects of work. In reflecting on this frame of children as helpless, it's clear that we really underestimate their contributions, the things that they are able to do, the work that they are able to participate in, and their ability to function independently and autonomously from adult supervision. But the opposite framing is just as limiting. This is the frame of the child as the little adult, basically the same as an adult, but shorter. One way this manifests is the way that children are represented interacting with objects correctly, or in keeping with their function. But actually, modern children interact with objects both in correct and incorrect ways, in resistant ways, in imaginative ways, and in explorative ways. So they might use a digging stick for its intended purpose, but they might try out different hand positions uh, to see how best to use it. Or they might use it as a walking stick, uh, or they might use it to hit their sibling. This ties into a broader problem in the way that we represent objects, is that we don't represent objects as multiple, the ways in which they can have multiple functions all at once. And so these stone bracelets can be a bracelet, can be a loom weight, but they also make a particularly effective teething tool. They're cold, they're smooth, they're easy to grasp. And as we think about the relationship between children and objects, 
One thing that stands out is the way objects can change as children develop. So, for example, these spouted vessels for a one-year-old make an excellent bottle, for a two-year-old make an excellent water toy, for a three-year-old can be used in imaginative play, and for a four-year-old can be used as a tool uh, for the work of childcare. The objects grow with children and their uses change as children grow and develop. Related to their use of objects, uh, in these reconstructions, children are represented as interacting with space in the same way that adults are interacting with space. But modern children interact with space quite differently than adults, exploring space, and through that exploration, making discoveries, welcome or unwelcome. Children's presence in a space can be an encumbrance, a hindrance to work. Or children can be outright destructive, as their exploration of space uh, can lead to damage of that space. And one thing we realize when we illustrate children being children in spaces is that spaces built with and around children must accommodate childishness. There are dangers associated with childhood. Children get into things. Children disturb things. And if you don't build space around that, uh, then you're asking for trouble. And my personal absolute pet peeve is the representation of children in the past as calm, quiet, focused, and unemotional. In the reconstructions I looked at, the emotions of children were largely pretty mild. They either had a neutral expression or an expression of engagement or interest, which was mostly just making eye contact with someone else in the scene. When they did express emotion, this emotion was predominantly positive, showing happiness or excitement. Only occasionally did they show sadness, fear, or anger, and when they did, the manifestations of these emotions were, again, pretty mild. Now, this ties into a much broader problem with the representation of emotion in the reconstructed past as incredibly mild and muted. Uh, but I'm already taking too long, so we'll just forge on ahead. But this muted emotion is particularly frustrating in representations of childhood, because childhood is a time of big feelings without the emotional maturity to control those feelings. It is a time of great fear, joy, frustration, sorrow, and anger. And these are all emotions that we can bring in to our reconstructions. Now, anger is a particularly interesting emotion uh, to explore in relationship to children. Because one thing we never see in reconstructions, because it's unpleasant, is the representation of children as both victims and perpetrators of violence, whether it's the developmental violence of hitting your sibling with a stick to see what's going to happen, or the sanctioned violence of discipline and abuse, or the violence of conflict. Children have the capacity to participate in this violence, but we don't think of them as having this capacity, and so we don't see it represented, and we don't change this narrative. But going back to this broader idea of children as small adults, when we think of children as little adults, we miss the way that they engage differently with the world around them. They're not adults physically, emotionally, or developmentally, and it's quite interesting to explore the ways that space and objects are used in this development. And it's in this way that art can be used as a means to reveal and challenge our preconceived notions around childhood. Um, the children are neither developed nor undeveloped, but are in a process of development. And it's quite interesting to explore this development. And it leads us to further questions about childhood, development, use lives, emotion, cooperation, and the relationship to work, play, and learning. And beyond a merely reflective practice, it can help us to new interpretations whether it's new object interpretations, like seeing a stone bracelet as a possible teething tool, or new object functionalities, like the way that when the spouted vessel is used as a water toy, it looks like the spouted vessel is peeing, which if you're three is the funniest thing you could possibly do.
or new sensory frameworks, like how mouthfeel is incredibly important to childhood experiences of objects and informs our sensory capacity into adulthood. But all this to say that reconstruction is a valuable tool for theoretical practice. It's exposed, it's concrete, it's visceral, but it's also slow and reflective and intentional. It's a different kind of engagement that's accessible to anyone, and I highly encourage that you try it. But I've already gone over time, so I want to thank you so much. If you want to get in contact with me, my email is rosemary.m.hansen at gmail.com. My website's reconsiderillustration.com, and you can find me on Instagram at reconsiderillustration.